So if it takes you like five pages until you understand something from that one image, you know, then so be it. That's just how long it's going to take you. Right. Um, here, let me, how the hell do I get rid of this iPad frame? It was gross. <laughs> okay, there you go. Oh, but it has a gross uh, watermark, but it's all right for now. You guys can just deal with it. <laughs> um, but I don't think it'll be too much in the way. Yeah, so this is the painting that I did. I can show you guys kind of the process of this while I explain this. Um, so like when I used to study anatomy, right? Like I would study like the arm, you know? And I would actually just spend like the whole day sometimes just trying to understand that goddamn arm, you know? And I would just like draw from all different angles. I would just read articles about like how to draw an arm. I would, uh, you know, write the names of the muscles and I would just constantly just be at arms about like how to draw an arm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, the pun got me. Yeah, pun intended. And and that's kind of the the point, you know, like like I would just like vigorously just try to figure it out, you know? And I find that like a lot of times people, when they're studying and then the information doesn't come right away, they they take it way too personal. They feel like, oh, uh, you know, um, like maybe I, the reference isn't good or maybe I'm not seeing it clearly. Like what's going on? And the answer is, is just real simple. It's just that you are really unskilled. And so you need a lot of practice a lot more than maybe someone else you know when i went to school i was the worst amongst my peers i was the, the lowest skilled uh student you know and what made me overcome that uh ultimately was that i just practiced more i remember even thinking there's like some 12 year old on deviant art like deviant art that are just painting like crazy good you know like these kids are just like nailing things to the walls and it's just a badass painting. And I'm here trying to draw like a circle and I can barely do it, you know? And so, so when I studied, I just, I would study until I understood it. And so, so with programming, it's the same thing. Like programming is the most recent thing that I've been learning. And I will just like, so I've been trying to learn certain coding uh, paradigms. And I'll just paint it over and over and over again. Like not paint it, but like program it. Like I'll just like recode it. And then I'll say to myself, okay, I think I understand this, this paradigm. So what if I try to create this circumstance? Can I do it? You know, like without looking, without like looking at the information. And I will try and sure enough, uh, it was it was garbage the first attempt, you know. So then I'd say, okay, okay, well, you know, I, I feel like I could have done better. Let me try again. And so I would try again. Hold on, I need to I didn't pr prep my workstation for such a setup, so I'm moving things around a little bit. Okay. So then I'll try again, you know? And I would like get lost. And then I'll say, okay, I, I clearly don't understand this as much as I thought I did, right? So, well, why don't I just like, why don't I just like go back, read my notes and see see what I could do differently. And I would re read my notes and then I would try it again. And I will try again and I will try again until it started making sense to me. And so I ultimately would do the test. Like I'll say, okay, now let me try to make a thing do a thing. And then once I figured out how to do that, then I was really happy that it was starting to work out, you know? And 
again, a lot of times I feel like people just don't do that. They just, they expect that if they studied for like a, you know, like an hour or two hours that they should just understand the subject matter. And like, whether you, you, you subconscious or like consciously know that that's wrong, you know, you intuitively know, well, that's obviously can't be the case. Right. Mm -hmm. Yet for whatever reason, your subconscious does not get the hit. Right. Your subconscious doesn't, because if your subconscious um, did, it wouldn't make you feel anxiety. It wouldn't make you feel like you're really fucking up because you're, you're more, um, your more logical mind, right? Your logical brain is like, no, we're good here. Like, of course, this is going to be a challenge. Just, let's just keep on trucking through in spite of, in spite of our suckiness. You know? Yeah. And that's, that's a hard thing to, to grasp, man. I get it. And it's a hard thing to like put into practice. I think it's easier to say than it is to do. I get that. <laughs> okay. I really do. I get it a million percent. But uh, you got You got to put that time in, and you got to practice. Um. So, if I had to give you a real straight answer now, like now that I've gone like like this super long winded answer, if I were to give, understand it. Yeah, if I were to give you kind of like a like a a, a one off, like okay, well, how how much should I study, AJ? Like when when should I know, like like that I should stop like studying this specific subject? when you can draw it without looking at your notes and reference that's when you should stop right like and i don't mean like in, in its in its entirety like right like the robot mix like just like the things that you're trying to be able to draw like those cylinders and those basic forms and shapes right like the sketches that you did during your studies mm -hmm. right that's what i mean by you should be able to do that like when you came to try to do it on your own you got lost. You you didn't even remember where to start, right? Like that should not happen. You should feel like you can at least get some basic start. Okay. So for instance, when I was learning programming, like it wasn't about learning how to um it wasn't learning how to like master um like a very specific sequence of coding it was just about a matter of like, can I just make this box move? Right. And understand why it's moving and why it wouldn't be moving, you know? Uh -huh. And then I'll just do that. And then if I couldn't move it, then I'll be like, okay, what the fuck did I forget to do this time? Like what, what button did I didn't press or what line of code or did I get my, syntax wrong you know with art it's the same kind of principle i would ask myself very simply like did i put in the right um values like when i was talking with tochi about like how to like kind of correct your issues because you know she was focused on some of the, the wrong problems same thing with dylan like when dylan was talking about his artwork he was like focused specifically on like some of the wrong issues right with his work like it wasn't so much about the forms uh, being painted wrong. It was more about he just had bad forms in general, like the design of them. Uh, Same thing with to Tochi. She was like, you know, you know, I, I don't feel like the sleeve is right. But then I was like, maybe it's a proportion problem. And we fixed the proportion. And sure enough, it was. So it's like whenever you're, you're making these mistakes, that's kind of how you approach it. You just say to yourself, what if I adjust this and that? But if you don't have anything to look at and adjust, then you don't really, you, you have nowhere to start. And so, like I said, um, your, your uh, basically your guideline to knowing when to finish your studies, okay? Mm -hmm. Like when you feel like you can, you can stop and, and try to like um, work on something else is after you feel you can draw a little bit of what you were talking about or what you were studying without any kind of reference and guide. That is a good system um, because it will really push you to the limit, okay? All right. and, and like I said, it, it, it could take you like 
three or four pages before you feel convinced to to move on to something else and that's totally normal and fine and in fact i'm kind of encouraging it okay, okay. thank you yeah any other questions I think I have a better way of painting noses now. I'm looking at this reference. Uh, I, I have one. Um, Go for it. Uh huh. Uh, it, it's like it's about uh, design rule, um, and it's like no parallels, and. I get the thing where like you use Wait, small design, design rule no parallels. Yeah. Wait, where do you hear this from? Uh, I watched like uh, several different tutorials, and I think there is one yours. Maybe I'm okay. not sure. Maybe in the design with confidence sort of. Okay, continue. Uh, and uh, I kind of don't know why, <laughs> you know. Yeah, okay. So especially if it's coming from me, uh, I think I might have, if I said never use parallels, I misspoke. But mm -hmm. I, I'm almost certain I didn't say that, <laughs> okay? Uh-huh. And the reason why is because, I mean, this philosophy of design I've had for quite a while, So, and especially before... Uh, I started doing tutorials like the way that I did them. Um, it's not so much that you should never do parallels. It's more like you should um, you should basically uh, hold on. You should basically feel or base. I'm sorry, I'm like getting distracted. Um, you should essentially always make sure that your designs have good amount of contrast and unity. Mm -hmm. And so uh, making parallel lines constantly is not enough contrast in a lot of cases. Does this make sense? Uh, yeah, actually, yes. Because if your design is constantly parallel, then you're, you're, you, you know, you're creating li little to, to no contrast, okay? Uh -huh. This is kind of the point of like what I'm, I usually try to make whenever I do these types of things. Okay. Okay. And so then, so then does that mean, then mean never use contrast? Well, in that context of what I just explained, that actually it doesn't. It means like if you're trying to like have an appealing image, you should be very aware aware of this. So does that mean we can we use parallel lines? Yeah, of course. So let's say we create a design that was all like really orthographic. So then maybe we can get the contrast, not in the shapes and the lines and the perspective. Maybe we'll get the contrast in the textures and the materials, you know? Mm -hmm. But there's a difference when you're knowing that you're doing it intentionally, right? Versus unintentionally. And that's usually what I try to get people to, to respect is the intention versus the inintention, the unintention, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're just drawing design and you have no idea like what's going wrong, that's the problem. Not so much that you should always just use parallel lines and never use parallel lines. How dare you? Don't you know the design gods are looking down at you with you know, regret and disappointment? No, it's not about that, right? It's, it's more about like just being more conscious of like, why did you put those parallel lines in the first place? Or why are you taking them out? Mm -hmm. that's that's the big, big difference does that make sense yeah 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 because again in, in that context it changes everything then right because then you're like okay well then i'm going to you know add parallel lines because it makes sense with my design choice right okay 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 versus just doing it because you heard somebody tell you not to do it yeah, yeah. Uh, you you heard something uh, like that and you don't hear the explanation and yeah, I, I'm almost certain that like if you go back and watch that video too, mm -hmm. that I might have said it in a way that was trying to be more general. Uh, I, I mm -hmm. like I said, I doubt that I was very like specific. 
Yeah, I, I actually don't think it was you. I think I watched it like from Steven Silver, but. Um, oh yeah, so that makes way more sense because uh -huh. Steven Silver is like more stylized, right? Uh -huh. So in that world, um, there's a lot of argument to say, yeah, you should probably avoid it in most cases, right? Because uh -huh. when you go stylized, that, that world of design is most likely to have less parallel lines, you know? Mm -hmm. Just by the nature of the of the of the design, you know. Okay. Um, but uh, but that's a that's a good example of what I'm trying to get at is like in the context of like maybe like you know more animation. Then yeah, there's there's a lot of good points to be made that yeah you should probably you probably should just avoid parallel lines right mm -hmm. but okay. in the, but in the context of like maybe you're doing like orthographic design for a video game or even like even for an animation i can think of a couple of animations that have characters that have parallel lines in their design right uh -huh. like a, a lot of these flash inspired looking animations um like the the regular show has some of that going on in there like with their limbs adventure time especially too right so it's yeah, yeah. clearly it's clearly not always the case <laughs> okay yeah and so and so it's it's just a matter of of the context uh i like to think of that there is no such thing as bad design okay just misplaced design so if you're designing something like i was talking about like with like um you know animation and you you draw this fucking crazy monster with 17 tentacles and has like a vagina for a mouth, you know, and it's like really like it's <laughs> really grotesque. <coughs> and it's for a kids show, yeah, you fucked up, man. You don't know what the hell you're doing, <laughs> right? Yeah, but I get it. But if it's like for like you know a, a new Stephen King film, right? Like it may, may or make perfect sense, <laughs> you know, to have a vagina mouth, right? Cool, cool. So hopefully you can see the difference of. The context matters like a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, artists talking about like their style. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. You should, like I said, you like even when I was talking about like getting critiques earlier, right? Like you should always be cautious of like what and who the, the person is saying to you, because because like sometimes it doesn't apply to you uh, directly, right? And I think it's good to listen to a lot of people's advice and just try to understand what they mean and where they're coming from, right? So, for instance, like I had a student who went to an event and they watched Marco Djurjevic talk, who's a really good artist, mm -hmm. and his whole talk was like, "Look, if you can't, if you don't know how to draw, then I'm never going to hire you," right? And he gave like this great speech about like the fundamentals of drawing and being like a good artist in that regard. Right, mm -hmm. and my friend was like super inspired, like my student, and he was just like, "Oh yeah, totally. It's totally about like drawing and being badass, you know." And um, and then when he started to uh, go to different workshops, like he went to go see Shadi Safadi, and Shadi Safadi is like completely opposite. It's like, like if you draw, you're never gonna make it in this industry. <laughs> yeah, like, I, need, I heard the speech. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like you need you need to go and like use photo bashing. You need to learn how to, um, you need to learn how to use 3D, right? And then my student was just like, "What? Like who's who's right?" You know, and he was so confused because like he just came out of a a, a talk and one instructor was saying it's all about it's all about the what you call it um drawing skills and he was like yeah and then the next instructor again who he respects a lot right? he respects shadi um because shadi is really good artist uh and shadi's like nah fuck that all that stuff and so he's super super confused right yeah and, and they're both legit <laughs> they're both legit and I was trying to explain to him, I was like, well, this this is what you need to understand. Like, you need to like look at both of them, and respect both of of what they're saying. So, you know, Shadi is 
trying to keep you more practical. And I think there's a lot of truth to that, right? Like you should definitely be able to uh, understand different tools, right? I think there is a lot of value in Hello? learning. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Can anyone, can anyone else hear me? Did I lose? Did I lose some of you guys? No. Jan says you can hear me. Anyone else can hear me? No, I think it's just... Anyway, I'll just finish my point. <laughs> um, so being more practical has a lot of value, right? Obviously, like learning all these different tools. And so Shadi is... Shadi's not wrong with this this assessment, but where he might be wrong is this idea that like that's all you need, you know. And and that's usually where I I kind of cut in and say yeah that's kind of problematic to teach people, <laughs> all right? It's it's a little more complicated than yeah you should just learn three D. Um. But then, like, uh, but Marco Djurjevic, he he's like all about like being a good artist and having an understanding of how to draw. And so, like for me, like that's a, a also a really good piece of advice, right? I always give it to my students. Even like you should be good artists. Like you guys shouldn't just learn how to. You shouldn't learn just how to, uh, what you call it, like do all these tools and these gimmicks. You should also like learn how to actually design and construct your designs, you know, from the ground up because that has a lot of value in a lot of different ways, not just because it makes you a better artist, but because you're able to kind of like from any point be able to make changes to your design like you have a lot more control than if you just use a lot of 3d or whatever and that control is is priceless it's really really is it's really kind of hard to find people who can just have total control over their whole entire process and usually i encourage people to learn how to draw and paint because of this specific point of like having absolute control. And so they're both right, but they're also both wrong because both of them existed. <laughs> you know, they both exist uh, and they're both, they both own concept art like uh, companies and they both make tons of money. So it's like, which one do you want to believe? Uh, and so this is why I always say you got to think about like their intent and then you got to think always about your own ambitions. Like, do you want to be the kind of artist that Shadi Safadi is? Then you should take everything that he says seriously. Did you, are you just coming back? Did, did yeah, I yeah. I just came back. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So I was basically, I'll, I'll just paraphrase, paraphrase it, but basically I was saying that, you know, Shadi Safadi is saying be more, you know, versatile and then uh and the power of that and then uh i was saying that you know marco de Djurjevic's more like you should have some fundamental skills and there's a lot of value in that and i said i was saying that they're both wrong and they're both right you know they're both wrong because yeah. they're, they're so absolute and that's the part that's wrong uh, but they're both right because that absolution um the the where it's coming from is there's a lot of merit in there you know like having a lot of fundamental skill is actually very powerful and i actually encourage that but i'm also like learn those tools yo tools are yeah so, yeah i get it you, you you can then apply it to the tools <laughs> yeah i think i think the best position uh for me is the one where you you can you know the tools and you know how to paint really well which is the hardest one <laughs> to get to but it's it's obviously the best one because you're super adaptable at that point mm -hmm. yeah thanks a lot
Yeah. Any other questions? One eye is bigger than the other, but I don't have liquify, so I can't fix it. <laughs> I just need to be a better artist. This is kind of why I, I was starting to fall in love with um, Procreate, because it, it kind of forces me to be better at drawing. I think I've handicapped myself a little bit with painting in Photoshop for so many years. There's like so many issues that I normally would correct already by using liquify and such, but it is fine. This is kind of the point. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got a question. So, uh, should you really like the the games or 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 whatever the company produces that you want to work for? Or me? No, no, you don't have to. I had friends who worked at Blizzard that never really played Blizzard games. Whether they liked it or not, it didn't really matter. It didn't affect them in their work. You know what I mean? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, uh, I always even talk about how I always talk about even like how I would um, probably just um, rather work for a company like Bethesda who makes games that I hate. Right? Sure. Um over a company like um, Naughty Dog, who they make games that I love. Uh, well, specifically now, I don't know. Maybe, maybe in the future, Naughty Dog will make something a little bit more fantastic, like more fantasy driven, or a little bit more, you know, just a little bit less contemporary. Is what I'm getting at. But as long as they keep it pretty contemporary, uh, I think I have to, have to, have to call it a no-go for me. You know? Yeah. And it's specifically because um, I like to draw like weird, weird stuff. You know? Yeah, so it sounds like you want to find the company that's most in line with your strengths, I guess? Yeah, not just my strengths, but also just like things that I'm interested in. Because uh, I might not have strengths in like I guess, very specific genre of art. Like for instance, cyberpunk. I don't do many cyberpunk stuff. But like, if they called me up and were like, "Hey, we want you to work on our cyberpunk game," you know, like I would love that. It would be challenging, but in all the right ways. You kind of get my point? Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, this is, this is a structural thing. I, should need, I just need to be better at my structure. I rely too much on the fact that I can, like, move stuff around later. But if I can just correct it sooner, then there's no need to redraw some of this stuff. Sorry, I'm talking to myself.
Any other questions? Yeah, just trying that up, bro. I'm not sure if I like it. I need to make this l less like a portrait, more like a weird design. No questions? Man, this smudge still, though. I might want to like figure out a process that I use more um, Procreate alongside Photoshop. Where I can like transfer between the two, that'd be dope. I hear that Photoshop is making an iPad version, but uh, I still doubt that it's going to be any good for a while. Not because they're not, they don't have the resources. It's just that like Procreate truly is for artists. Anyway, any other questions, friends? Oh, yeah, weird. It makes something weird. Oh, that is weird. I like that. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. You need a new layer though. I've got a question. So uh, if, if you apply to a company and you're kind of a few states away, is that basically immediately kind of a, a disadvantage over someone who's closer? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that, that one's a, that one's a obvious. Yes. Um, now, The way that you should think about it is, is as follows, is that whenever you're, um, whenever you're trying to apply for a job, you know, you might not be the only one, right? Um, and then also, you know, you have to keep in mind the stuff like location. They're, they're obviously going to hire, like imagine if someone is as good as you, or close as like it's it's pretty good like they're good but they're like somewhere in the same skill range maybe it's it's really hard to determine who's better or who's worse in, in this like circumstance and it very rarely happens usually there's just people that are just really good mm. yeah it's like really like they'll like go through like a gambit of people that are pretty good but they're all pretty good and then they'll like you know go through the process of interviewing but ultimately you know uh, the ones who are really good usually stand out. But let, let's say it's a circumstance that does happen, which is, you know, you and a few others are in this gauntlet of fire, okay? And it's a matter of, like, you know, what the studio thinks. Um, if if they find that there's, like, a person that is just as good as you that's local, yes, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer then, right? Um. But the the thing is, is that they they wouldn't have um, they wouldn't have like discounted your stuff if you had really amazing work. You get my point there? Like yeah. they they would definitely consider you. And and here's the thing, like 
like you might be you might be going up against like a, a bunch of other artists and they all might also not be local you know it's not just like we only want to hire local artists like sometimes the best artists aren't local they just aren't you know and so you might be amongst that uh the the group that is really being um you know scouted and then they just got to think about who's worth spending money on you know who's worth bringing out uh and spending some extra dough and and so then going back to what i always try to teach people is that you know you want to have value that makes it hard for people to turn you down in, in my case like i've gotten to a point in my career where uh, i get offered uh jobs quite a bit you know, at least every month I get like one offer or so, right? Whether it's for contract work or for st uh, actual studio work, you know? And uh, it's just how it is. Because I've built like a large reputation with my work, right? That allows this opportunity for people to want to to try to bring me in and work with. And you only can build that is by you know having a quality portfolio and putting your name out there you know very rarely is it just my experience alone that gets me these opportunities we're like hey we saw that you worked at blizzard so we want to give you a job it's like it doesn't necessarily work like that it's like oh we saw that your portfolio is really good we want to give you a job that's the most likely situation um, and a lot of them are, yeah, remote. Like there was one uh, that was like 300 miles away from where I live that wanted to hire me. And they knew that I lived far and there was like, would you be willing to relocate? And the answer to that was no. You know? Mm -hmm. If you're working freelance, is it? especially if you're first kind of starting off, is it hard to really have a consistent living enough so to make enough money to really uh, depend on that? Yeah, in the very beginning. I think even when you're in the middle, it's still hard. It's, it's like kind of like the Wild West. You got to like keep yourself uh, pretty, pretty fluid. So it's kind of like a bit of feast or famine? Yeah. Uh, and, and what I do though is like a lot of my income doesn't come from just freelance. It, it comes from teaching and the tutorials that I do, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't really worry so much about it because I have a, I have an ounce, you know, but I do like taking freelance because that extra income is nice. And then, um, and then also just allows me to to stay on top of like my game, you know, that's another thing that's really important to me. Is just being a skilled artist and recently i've been working on um, projects and a lot of those projects are really good uh, and a lot of the work that i've done for them was really good but nobody will see them for like for like years and i was like you know maybe i should like start painting uh high quality portfolio looking images again because i've been just doing sketches and I'm like, oh, you know, I, I think, I think it's time to come back and show how it's done. See, so, a lot of stuff on ArtStation, and just kind of like, you know, I don't think people will know that they should like really challenge themselves a little bit more. But you know what? There's a couple artists that really do that. They really push the envelope. But uh, the majority of people just kind of follow suit. You just see some really impressive artists online, and they just kind of copy their their style and that's that brings you no value um because those artists unfortunately for you already exist unless you want to be like a discount version of them but then but then even then like you're really selling yourself short i remember um one time i uh my friend was approaching me and she was like, 
uh, a recruiter and she's like hey do you know anybody that works or has work that's like um craig mullins and i was like yeah craig mullins and she's like no nah, like we try to reach out to him and, and we got his rates and we just can't afford him and i was like what and this is like a triple a company and i was thinking to myself like you can't afford him and i was like do you mind uh, me asking like what how much he was charging and she was like oh yeah he was charging like like twenty five thousand dollars like a painting and i was like okay yeah <laughs> you can't afford them <laughs> yeah because they're like we need like hundreds of paintings like we can't pay for this dude <laughs> and so so they um so i, I sent them a couple artists that i thought were pretty good they're similar and so there, there is there is a market for some discount versions of some of these badasses, uh, but the the solution to that is like don't fucking charge twenty five thousand a painting. That's crazy. <laughs> but that's like the that's like the feast and famine argument again, right? Like if yeah. if if James uh, or sorry if James Cameron hires you know Craig Mullins to work on like five or six paintings, you know Craig Mullins doesn't have to work the rest of the year, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that could be like a month's worth of work for him, sure. Or maybe even if it's like three months of work, it's still like then the rest of the year he doesn't have to do anything. Uh, I'm nowhere near that level, nor that do I think that that's a level that I should be at. Maybe if I'm like really prestigious, you know, maybe I work on something that's like, like because of my art, it was this legendary film. Like I think like Sid Mead is a good example of this. Like there's only very few artists that I can say are like this, you know? Yeah. Um, maybe then I'll reconsider this idea of like charging like two twenty 20 grand per painting. <laughs> but right now I don't feel that way at all. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. But I don't mind charging like um, what I charge now, which is somewhere around 500 to $650 uh, a day. So if someone wants like uh, work from me, I say it costs that much a day. And a day can be spread between two or three days, right? Essentially, whenever I submit work to them, that would be considered a day's worth of work, right? And um, I usually spend upwards between four to five hours. Like, like it's, it's kind of like a half day. It's not like a full day. But like a four to, four to five hours to me is a day's worth of work. So I'll spend like an hour or two on one day and then the next day I'll work another hour or two. Because what I do with the rest of my time is other freelance potentially and then uh, school stuff, right? And then uh, I've been learning programming. But because I paint so quickly, it, it, it looks and feels like I worked like a day, you know? Yeah. And ultimately, if that's, that's what um, they wanted from me and that's what I'm asking from them, then they should respect that, you know? Uh, if I give them the work and it's good, it's what they wanted, then there's no problems, there's no complaints. You know? Makes sense. I just sent uh, work last last night to my clients and then uh, they loved it. And, you know, it was uh, a few hours of work. And uh, they, they liked it a lot. So, again, like, the way I think about it too is um, they're paying for my expertise, not for my literal time. You know, it's not like a, they're not paying like me an eight hour work day or something like this. You know, they're paying for my, what I can bring to them, you know? Yeah. Cause if, if they're going to then say, you know, we're, we want you to go on a hourly rate and I only work four to five hours per thing, then I'm just going to say, okay, well then each hour is worth 115, $125 an hour. Right. So I just change, I just move the dial, you know? Yeah. And so then, so then they they will ultimately want me to work less, <laughs> you know? Um, but I haven't had any complaints with the system that I have now. In fact, I feel like I should increase that rate, you know, more. Cause I, I, I get clients that hire me for very specific needs and I do it like perfectly the first time and i'm not trying to say that i'm like this badass artist that i can do everything perfect right mm -hmm. it's like they go to my website they see like a monster that i draw right and they're like we love this can you do something like this for us and i'm like yeah and so it's something that i already know how to draw and i draw a lot of already 
Mm. You know? And so then I draw it for them and they're just like approved, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so it's like, I usually expect like, you know, iterations and variations, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but when they're like, no, there's none. So then essentially something that I was expecting like, to be like a week's worth of work is only like literally like a day's worth of work and I'm done working with them. So that's only like $500 or $600, right? So I'm like thinking, okay, I need to like, I might, I might need to increase that, you know? Yeah. So these people are hiring me for jobs that I can just do like right out of the gate. And this is probably the time where I should just ask for more money. Which probably explains what Craig Mullen has done, but uh, again, I still think it's way too much. But uh, that's a that's some really good insight uh, overall, though, for you guys. Hopefully, I usually recommend my students charge no less than thirty dollars an hour. Like that should be no less um, for all of you guys. Uh, if you feel like your work is a little bit better, then you can go higher, obviously. But thirty dollars is like what I believe an entry level, like really noobish artist should be charging. Like, and I'm talking about uh, like the lowest tier artist that you guys can probably imagine. Because still, like it's it takes like not obviously like stick figure people. I'm talking about like people that can draw. You can tell they can draw. They can paint. You know, they can do a reasonable job. But they're no, they're not like the kinds of artists that you guys admire, right? And yeah. so. Uh, and so many of you guys, in fact, if not all of you, fall into that category is what I'm getting at. As long as you can complete a painting and, and or a final concept, you you, sh you fit in this category. Because what that takes is really hard just to even finish a thing, you know? Um, like my friend, he does this board game stuff and then he, he commissioned some artists to do some work. And it was like this full painting of a character, right? And he was like, ah, you know, like... I. I, I don't know if I got ripped off or not. Like, I, I, I really love it. I love what she did, you know, but it cost me like 75 bucks. And I was like, no, nah, dude, you ripped her off. <laughs> I was like, because think about what you just got. You got like this full illustration, right? Imagine it took her like eight hours to do it. You were essentially paying her like $10 an hour, dude. like a little above minimum wage, you know? And I was like, that's fucking, that sucks for her because she can just go to work at McDonald's and, and make that money and then have consistency. And I think even McDonald's has benefits, <laughs> you know? So it's like, like, think about that, right? Like we are, we can do better than some of these low tier jobs. Okay. So I think $30, maybe I think $35 because things, times have changed is like what I believe is a good minimum wage salary now if you for an artist and this is specifically for freelance now if you work for a studio where they give you all the benefits and they cover all your costs and 401k and all that great stuff i think you can actually go a little bit lower but even then i would say stay pretty close to 30 you know yeah because even like bankers um make a little over 20 dollars. some of these more prestige bankers so <clears throat> what we do is is a is a is a is a job that's really valuable. So respect that. Um, yeah, I I think if you like if you're pretty good, like if you feel like you're a little bit better than a, a, an average artist, then that's when you can start going to like fifty, sixty dollars an hour. And if you feel like really, really good, like if you're at the top end, like kind of where I'm at, that's when you can get closer to a hundred dollars. And then if you're like the kinds of people like Vitaly Bulgarov, like the clear, there's only like two other artists that could probably do what he does, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, now that's changed because more people have kind of like replicated his style. So there's more like probably like a hundred artists that can kind of do what he did. But there's a time where he's like literally like one out of like two people. Right. Um, then yeah, you could probably charge like upwards of two hundred, if if not five hundred dollars, like per hour, right? Because you are literally like one of a kind. Um, but now I think it's it's a little bit different. And he, I think he's aware of that too. He's a smart guy, so he's started to learn how to make video games. So, which is a good idea, because that's what I'm doing too. Not for the same reasons. I think that my my skill set is still pretty hard to replicate because it requires you to actually paint really well. Uh, where Vitaly, um, a lot of what he was able to do is actually now 
easily re- replicatable because of tools are getting better, right? Yeah. So it's, it's because before you had to like, have like an expertise in modeling to be able to kind of do what he did, you know? Uh, but now it's like the tools are so much more efficient and more, way more uh, easy to use that anyone can start kind of creating these really complex mechs like he does, you know? So anyway. I'll take one more question and then I'll send you guys out to the world. I have a question going back to the whole industry thing. Like how like consistent is like the work and all that? Like is it completely based <laughs> on like freelance or permanent work? Because I know you worked at like Blizzard and all them, but I was yeah. wondering if like or did you just quit to move on ahead to go somewhere else or you, know, you can do whatever you want if you're allowed those opportunities uh, i always recommend that people focus only on two things which is the quality of your work and the connections that you make that's all you should worry about you can't you can't control anything else you can't control whether a company decides to restructure like blizzard activision just did and lay off 800 people you know, you have no control over that, right? But you can control the quality of your work, right? And the people that you, like the friends that you've made and the connections that you've made, which increases your chances to not get laid off. You know what I mean? Because if, yeah. you're, if you're one of the best artists on the team, you probably, it's very unlikely you're going to get fired, right? But if you're just kind of like, just kind of just got in and you just became complacent, I mean... It's not a surprise why you probably got laid off, you know, as bad as that sounds, it's just how it is. It's the reality of it, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, and then the people that, you know, like that's like, maybe you are again, like maybe you're not as good as like the best artists in your team, but you're really friendly and you work really well with others and you're really effective at what you do. Just even if you're not the best, that can keep you your job too, or get you jobs in the future, you know? Okay. But if you have a combination of those, like you're really friendly and you're really good to work with, you're really easy to work with, you're really kind and nice to others and you have great communication and all the stuff that people like, you have lots of friends in the industry and you're a badass, your chances are, are increased tenfold in terms of your opportunities, you know? But that's all it is, is you're just increasing the percentage of your opportunities. That's all you're really doing. You're not, you're not guaranteeing anything. You're just increasing chances right yeah and that's the way you should think about it you should never think of it as like i am guaranteed this thing because you can never control the the climate of the industry the economy the the shifting of technology these things you just can't control but what you can do is pay attention to them right and uh, move accordingly right like i am convinced that a lot of jobs including some of those stuff that we do will be replaced by some sort of tool or the tools are going to be easier and less people need, need you around. So having a more general understanding of everything is, is a valuable thing. And I feel like that's why it's important for me to start learning how to program and make my own video games and make my own tools and such. Right. Because this, this is going to have a lot of value because then I can start teaching other people how to do it, you know, in the future when it becomes more and more relevant to try to shift your gears a bit. Right. Yeah. Um, and then start opening doors for people like I did with painting, you know, and start opening doors for people now to learn how to program and make their own projects and create their own, uh, IPs, you know, but that is me being forward thinking, right? Yeah. You also should consider this. I think there was a uh, one guy I think I saw on YouTube. I think his name was Bobby Choi did the schoolism. Oh yeah, like, Bobby. It's great. Um, it's like ask yourself. Uh, think what you'd ask yourself in 10 years or something like that. Yeah, totally. So that's, that's, that would be my advice overall. You should always think forward. You should look forward and, and move forward. But with that being said, thank you. Um, it's been a great class, y'all. You guys have been doing killer jobs. I'm very proud of everybody's work and progress. You guys are great students. I'm very happy with all the stuff that's been done. Keep up the good work. Keep up the positive attitude. Don't be strangers. Keep in touch with one another like I was just talking about. That's really valuable. 
and don't stop that painting, man. Like keep painting, keep working, keep your eyes focused, become a master at the trade. And then eventually transition to other skills like learning more 3D or learning more photo bashing and all, all these types of things. So that way you can even become better at the things that you do. With that being said, peace out friends. Talk to you guys later. Hope you guys have a great, great weekend and a great uh, month after. All right, laters y'all. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.